the theater department does this thing? I don't as much anymore. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're glad you're here today. Uh, this is an event hosted by the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and Democracy. And um, for those of you who expected to see Nicole Hemmer here, um, it's pretty obvious that I am not Nicole Hemmer, who is <laughs> going to be your moderator today. Uh, the talented Nicole is under the weather, unfortunately, and, uh, and couldn't be with us. And so I am pinch hitting for, for Nicole, but I'm, I'm very proud to be here. And I'm glad that you all have come out and glad our online audience is here today as well. Um, my name's John Siegenthaler, and I spent about 30 years uh, in journalism working for uh, about a decade at NBC News as a correspondent and an anchor. And I now am managing partner at Finn Partners uh, communications firm here in Nashville. Uh, I am really pleased to get to talk about an issue I care a lot about, um, which is media coverage of politics and elections. And we're glad to have, again, our online audience here as well. But I've got two experts who really know a lot more about it and have, and have been doing it a lot more recently than I did. Um, first of all, we have Chris Steyerwald, who's the former political editor at Fox News. He was a member of the network's 2020 decision desk, responsible for calling the results. And he was fired by the network for calling Arizona for President Biden instead of President Trump. Steyerwald is now a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a contributing editor at The Dispatch. And you can see him on News Nation. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. On, on a regular basis. We're glad to have you here today, Great to Chris. You. And, and Josh Clinton is a senior election analyst at NBC News, uh, as well as the Abby and John Winklefried uh, Chair, a professor of political science here at Vanderbilt University, where he co-directs the Vanderbilt Poll. They both have written books. Uh, Chris has written a new book called Broken News, Why the Media Rage Machine Divides America and How to Fight Back. Um, so we're glad to have both of you here today. Our pleasure. I, I, Chris, can you just start with why you were fired by Fox, how it happened? Oh, that. Well, <clears throat> uh, I don't know why Fox <laughs> fired me. The, there have been a couple things that they've said, uh, and I don't really care. They don't owe me a job, um, and I have never been more professionally happy in my life. I get to hang out with people like you now, uh, which is cool. Um, but I do know this, after uh, our decision desk, as usual, and I say this with love, beat the competition uh, and did a great job in 2020, um, a lot of Fox viewers were really, 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 really upset with me. When you say beat the competition, can you explain what you mean? We were the first to call. So basically, um, in any presidential election, there's a handful of states that all, all, we love all states and all states matter, but there's always a handful of states that, so in 2020, for example, we knew that Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, and Arizona were basically the basket of relevant states. Um, and every path for Trump meant that he basically had to, he didn't have to win them all, uh, but he couldn't afford to lose could he have lost two and still won? Yeah, they, they were different paths, yeah. Yeah, there, I think he could have, I think there was one scenario he could have lost, I think Michigan and Arizona, I forget what it was, but every one of those states that Donald Trump did not win uh, was a shot under the water line uh, for him. And to lose Arizona, which is one of the Republican states, and if you've lost Arizona, which is a lot more Republican than Pennsylvania, you're probably not going to then, go, you're not going to lose Arizona and win Pennsylvania in most scenarios. So we did what we were supposed to do. Uh, so you called it first, Fox called it first. Well, we called Arizona first. 
uh, and that was consequential. And as the January 6th committee hearings uh, revealed, uh, it was very consequential in the White House, uh, and it got people very upset at the White House. And it was fun. <laughs> That's a weird word for it. Uh, it was fun uh, to get to hear uh, the testimony uh, from people inside the White House that night about how they responded to our call. Uh, that was, that I, I got uh, a kick out of that. What I knew at the time was that our viewers were furious, were choked with rage, so angry at us on the decision desk. And uh, as I was stunned to learn, I was, I was sort of ignoring it, right? When you make a call, when you guys make a call, you're like, well, yeah, the people who are losing aren't happy. We know this, right? This is to be expected. But then a friend of mine's like, hey, uh, there's a US senator on the radio calling for your firing for being involved in a cover-up. I was like, what? I don't have any ballots under the table here. There's no, I, I don't actually get to award Arizona's electoral votes. Um, and at that point, I realized that there was this real cresting wave of anger uh, out there over the call. And somebody actually sent me a tweet, never tweet, never tweet. Uh, somebody sent me a tweet yesterday where there was a thread mentioning this call uh, in why Republicans should not trust Fox on election night this year, two years later. So uh, they were high on their own supply. Uh, it got, and it got really weird there for a minute. Uh, and then I didn't work at Fox anymore. And did you get, how did you find out? Uh, well, I don't want to get into all that too much. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I found out on a Zoom call and uh, it wasn't a great day, but- uh, They told you you were fired on a Zoom call. Well, yes, they did, they did, they did. Um, but uh, it was COVID, so, I mean, they weren't gonna have me come in the office, so that's okay. Uh, and then it was okay. We'll talk about that more, but Josh, while he was doing that, what was going on at NBC? Well, you know, so when Fox called it, you know, we were looking at our models and, you know, a, so I'm happy they called it, uh, but like at NBC, like, you know, there's a, a concrete line between what we're doing and kind of what the editorial people are doing. And so when we were looking at our models, like, you know, we knew Arizona was gonna be close. And so any close race, like, you know, when you're watching election night coverage, you'll see these exit polls are reported first thing. And so the thing about polling is that, you know, we all know that how you analyze results has a great deal of what they show. And so like, we never make any calls on any close races on exit polls, right? And so let me give you some guidance of what's going on, but like, you never want to call a close race, especially in the control for the presidency in the hyper-partisan times that we have going on. And so when Fox News um, called the race, like, you know, if you had pushed, shut, come to shove, like we had about like 70% chance that, you know, Biden was gonna win. But you know what, we have standards at like 99.5%, we had to be certainty. And so like, we watched them, and so at that time, like, you know, given how the vote was being counted in Arizona, like the first they count, you know, all the, you know, a lot of the mail vote, and then the election day vote, and so like, we saw that Trump was catching up. And so, you know, in the days that kind of came afterwards, we were kind of watching, every single day we'd log in to get the report from the Arizona Secretary of State, and we'd be calling counties, figuring out, what ballots were outstanding because as the election day, as the early vote ballots were being counted, like sure enough, as, it, as the votes were being counted closer and closer, as they were mailed closer and closer to election day, they were trending more and more in the Republican kind of direction. And so we were not certain about the number of votes that were outstanding and how those votes were ultimately break to basically be 99.5% sure that there was not enough votes there for President Trump to actually ch catch at the end. Well, you don't think we called the race with a 70% probability, do you? I am saying that when, uh, when we were looking at it, that's the kind of, the, the, that's, the, that's the race that, you know, you know, because like, you know, as you know, like when we're making these projections, right, we're looking at expected votes, kind of how you think that vote's gonna, gonna, gonna cast out. And so that's just like my mental model about kind of what I was kind of, you know, thinking about like what it would likely be. So an important thing to remember here is we were working with two different sets of data. And one of the persistent problems for election night forecasting, and I don't know whether the world will continue to do election night forecasting. I think a model, a Kornackiite model, where we're looking at real vote and we're tracking real vote uh, may be the future. And it may be uh, what is required uh, in these times of low trust in institutions. That may be necessary. I mean, I, the public, I suspect, doesn't have a clue how this works. 
and it's complicated. It, it is not um, somebody in a back room saying, well, let's just call it for Arizona. Let's call it for, for uh, Biden. Can you give us a little sense of what goes into that process that, it, that is understandable for, for people? Yeah, is I mean, it possible? I mean, it's, you know, so it's, a, it's not something that happens on election night. So like Chris and I, like we're working like right now, looking at early vote returns, like checking out how state laws have been changed, trying to figure out voter registration, trying to look at polling results and kind of knowing, because like everything is decentralized in the United States, like all the election administration is at the county by county level. And so you really need to know all those details. So for example, in Pennsylvania, Right, one of the reasons it took so long to call Pennsylvania is because you know, they held their primary during the COVID pandemic, right? And so when you voted in the primary, you get the option to vote by mail on come November. And so a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats took that option, but then that became very politicized. And so then Republicans were much more likely to vote on election day. But it turned out that in Pennsylvania, like not only did they change the rules so that you, they could only start counting or vote by mail ballots on election day itself, but then also in order to cast a ballot, if you were mailed the ballot in Pennsylvania, you had to bring the ballot, the envelope for the balance, ballot, and the security envelope outside the ballot as well in order to kind of cast a valid ballot. If not, then you had to cast what was called a provisional ballot that would still be counted, but only after all the other ballots were counted. And so like traditionally we think that Democrats are, are voting provisionally, but here in Pennsylvania we're thinking about well, it could be that Republicans are, are casting provisional ballots. And so like in the days following the actual election day, we had a team of like 10 or 20 people calling every single county officer in the state of Pennsylvania, trying to figure out like how many provisional ballots do you have? And trying to estimate on the basis of that and the reports that we were getting and how they were breaking, you know, what was gonna go on. And so it's not just an exercise of, you know, surely counting the votes as they come in is a really important part of it, but it's also kind of knowing the process, how that varies across states, across counties, when they count the vote. Historical returns. And historical precincts. returns. What precincts. about exit polls? I mean, exit polls uh, for NBC play a different role. I mean, NBC uses them to kind of tell the story, right? So when you cast a ballot, you know who wins and loses, but you have no idea why people are voting for them. Maybe they like their hair, maybe they like their positions. Like, it doesn't tell you, like, what voters are actually thinking. And they lie sometimes. They've told, they, and some candidates have told them to lie, right, Chris, on these exit polls? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, people say a lot of things. Um, so... <laughs> Exit, exit polls uh, stopped working when people stopped exiting polls. Exit polling was always a little iffy. I think an important thing people should remember about survey work, um, we have a lot of national political survey work going back to the 1950s and into the 1940s. Uh, do you know how the Gallup organization originally polled people? They would stop enough people on the street until they thought that they had a pretty representative sample. They're like, you voting for Truman or you voting for Dewey? And then they'd say, it's a poll, what do you think, right? And people didn't know a lot about it and it seemed like magic, right? Here's this magic, they only talked to a relatively small number of people, but they've been able to tell us what the whole country thinks. Uh, and it was, polling is still as much art as it is science um, because of every poll, represents a bunch of assumptions that people like us have made. How many people, what percentage of the electorate's gonna vote? Uh, how many men, how many women? Uh, how many black voters, how many white voters, how many poor voters, how many rich voters? All of that is an assumption that we build based on what was performance like last time, and then the like, a little Kentucky windage, right? You're like, well, I figure the polls have been saying that turnout is up, that people, that voter intensity is up, so maybe we ought to goose that a little bit. And uh, as my old daddy would have said, you get a hunch and you bet a bunch. Uh, and you do a poll. Now, part of the problem <laughs> is that in the aughts, uh, especially, the world of public opinion research became, went from being pseudoscientific to being scientific. And people talked about the polls as if they were magic emanations. And the polls have said this, the oracle has spoken, and now this will occur. Uh, as opposed to, this is a snapshot in time, this is a pretty good guess that we have based on the information available to us. So in, 19, in 2016, about 40% of voters voted earlier absentee. 
So you can't exit poll them. They ain't exiting a poll, so you cannot exit poll them. And you know the exit poll, uh, nice people with clipboards stand outside the polling places. Republicans run away from them, and Democrats walk up and say, I'd like to tell you why I voted this way. Um, so in, that was 40% of were early and absentee in 2016. In 2020, that increased by 50% because of the pandemic. So there was no way that you could do an exit poll in 2020. Now, lucky for Fox, is that after the 2016 election, Rupert Murdoch decreed that we would not be part of the exit poll consortium anymore and got out. And we said, that's wild, man. Are you sure you want to do it? <clears throat> it's going to be expensive. It's going to be hard. But fortunately, we found partners in the Associated Press and the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. And we built a new thing, which was a lot, a lot of uh, completed interviews online, which aren't really good for uh, horse race, not, as, not that good for horse race, but good for knowing about the, the uh, electorate, and just tons and tons and tons of survey work, but no exit poll. And we tried it first in 2018. We tried it, and it was a real bell ringer. It was really good. And it kept, we did it in special elections, and it really worked. So we rolled into 2020. We said, we've got the best forecaster that money can buy. We've really done it. We have these great partners and we're going to do it. And going into the election, Fox was like, we have the best, we have the, the, the ad said best in class decision desk. New York Times writes it up. LA, to everybody's writing up how great our decision desk is. We were like, we must be pretty awesome. This is pretty good. And then we like, we did it. And they're like, we didn't actually want you to do it, I don't think. I think that is not what we really wanted you to do. Um, and it turned out that they had built a product that was not good for their business model. It's great to call races if you're calling races that your audience likes. But if you're giving your audience stuff that they don't want to hear, that's not good for business. And uh, we were insulated from a lot of that stuff in the news division. We were not thinking about it in those terms, and we also didn't know, I didn't, I didn't apprehend how much political life in America had changed even in five years. I, I want to get into that, but you mentioned the consortium. Josh, can you explain, I mean, I think most Americans have no idea what the consortium is. <laughs> yeah, so it's, so I mean, the history of election polling is interesting, right? So you think about like Dewey versus Truman, Dewey beats Truman, right? That was all the Chicago Daily Tribune based purely on pre-election polling that Chris is talking about. Right? And then in 1952, CBS has a broadcast news, and they were kind of given this kind of UNIVAC special computer where they start actually casting election ballots. Right? By 1956, all the major networks have computers and decision desks casting ballots. And then kind of fast forward is that you know, there's no central repository where you actually get the vote data. Right? And so what the networks did is eventually they came together to kind of pool the resources to try to collect all that vote. Right? You try to predict the election in New Hampshire, and you're talking to 200 different townships who are all casting their votes. That's really a super expensive kind of process. And so the networks kind of pool the resources for a long period of time to do exit polling, to do vote casting. Um, up until 2000, they were also coordinating on the actual making calls, right, on, on election nights and stuff like that. But then that, you know, it's Florida happened. There was kind of a, an issue there. So then the <laughs> networks kind of went their separate ways in 2002, and so now it's kind of more decentralized, although you still have sharing. So like in, after 2016 and in 2020, you know, Fox and AP work together to collect votes and do an exit poll, and then you have ABC, CBS, NBC, um, and CNN kind of working together to kind of collect votes and kind of doing their own exit polls. And so you've had a little bit more decentralization of the basic tasks of collecting vote and conducting exit polls. And even in 2022, you have other new players like Decision Desk HQ who are kind of entering and kind of doing their own kind of vote collection. And so you have different networks doing different polling operations and kind of coordinating kind of differently. All of them are ultimately responsible for making their own calls right, and kind of analyzing the data and presenting the data differently, but sometimes there's cost savings in terms of how they coordinate to kind of collect some of the data that they're using. And as you said, Chris, all of this was in order to be first. Right. And that's because you want more people to watch you than NBC, right? Well, I mean... Look, I was in it too. I, uh, I mean, in, I get it. In, in uh, Jan Olden days, uh, election... So think about it this way. For the most of the 20th century, and who am I telling this to? 
Uh, for most of the 20th century, news was a lost leader. 60 Minutes was the first television news show that ever made a nickel for anybody, right? For the big three, the evening news was something to do to keep the FCC off your back so that Newton Minow wouldn't come knocking on your door uh, and so that you could say that you were wholesome and decent. Uh, and then you could go make money uh, showing the young and the restless. So <clears throat> it wasn't really until the end, the late part of the 20th century, that TV news as something profitable had ever occurred to anybody. And this is overlaid with a incredible profusion uh, with the arrival of cable news. Uh, the 1990s uh, saw the, this incredible upheaval of how Americans get their news, where they get their news. Um, and you know, you'll remember when Ted Turner said he was gonna have a 24 hour news network, that sounded crazy. Who would watch the news? 24 hours, this is boring, it's the news. Um, and what happened over time is that the, the wall became, at, so NBC has a lot of advantages and MSNBC has a lot of advantages because of NBC News. So NBC News is the, you know, the dreadnought of the network news shops, right? They're serious, they're funded around the world, they have all the bureaus, they do all of the stuff. And MSNBC uh, takes that content and makes it into something attractive, right? Uh, Fox had a news division. When I started at Fox a dozen years ago, Fox had a news division and it was clear, right? Brett Baer, Chris Wallace, me, it was the, 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 we were in the Washington Bureau and we were mostly ignored because we were expensive and didn't produce a lot of ratings, right? We were there, so we, we were there to say like, say what you will about whatever Sean Hannity said, but we have these legitimate journalists who are doing this legitimate work uh, in the Washington Bureau. And it was really good, it was really, really good because we were uh, benign, benignly neglected. Uh, and we had great Washington coverage, and you know a lot of the guys who, who worked for Fox, like Major Garrett and a bunch of people who did great work uh, in the Fox Washington Bureau. But over time, the news division at Fox came under increasing pressure because if you are accustomed to, and this isn't just Fox, uh, in my book I talk about what you can see at the Washington Post, what you can see at, at, at a lot of outlets. Americans have become habituated because in a atomized media space, in 1973, something like two thirds of all American households tuned in to one of the big three evening news broadcasts, right? And they still couldn't make money. But anyway, uh, the, the, if you have, on a really good night if Tucker Carlson has three million viewers, that's nothing, right? Three million people, that's nothing uh, in a country of 330 million people, that's nothing. But it can be very profitable if they come back night after night after night after night. And so was true for Rachel Maddow, and so is true for the Washington Post. It's not about broadening your audience, it's about narrowing it down and telling people what they wanna hear. Um, in uh, politics, there's a joke about what you do, you treat your political base like mushrooms you keep them in the dark and you cover them with horse manure. And <laughs> <clears throat> what news outlets discovered was that if you ever interrupt the flow, right? If you ever break the flow in any way and have some bad thing come in, right? Some unfortunate news that in some way says that the other people may not be evil or that you may not be right, this upsets people and they will change the channel and they will buy their pre-lubricated pocket catheters uh, and my pillows from another provider. Huh? And huh? this is not helpful for making billions of dollars. So I will just, I, I, I'll shut up after I say this. The, but the whole point is to be first. Well, but, but the thing is, we thought the point was to be first. Right. And there used to be competitive advantage in being first. But if you are first to tell people what they don't want to hear, there is no competitive advantage in being first because you're not going for a broad audience. You are going for a narrow audience. And if you tell a narrow audience what it doesn't want to hear, they'll say, I'm thinking about watching Newsmax. So, Josh, yep. why do all this? Why not just take the numbers and report them? Well, so, so I think there's two things going on. I think an election night coverage kind of makes 
what Chris was talking about puts in a pretty stark perspective, right? Because you turn on in a daily basis to, you know, pick your favorite poison in terms of what you want to watch. But on election night, it's, a, it's something that's going on is quite different, right? So on election night, the media is trying to be an umpire, calling balls and strikes, looking at the vote that's coming in, right, and getting it right, right? I mean, that's, you know, if you get something wrong, 2,000. Right, 2,000, you're in front of Congress, like, you, you know, it's not a good thing. Right? And so the most important thing on election night is to kind of look at the data that's coming in, whatever editorial biases that people may bring to the table, like you need to put that aside and kind of call straight up the middle, look at what the data is showing you and kind of make the call. And why is that important? It's important because like you think about if, we, if the media does not step into that role, right? And this is kind of like the old view of the media as being the objective, the, for, the check on politicians, like well, you're gonna leave that up to politicians to call what's gonna go on? Right, so the thinking about the transparency, like where this vote's coming from, like what the different process is, like otherwise, if the media cedes that space, then it, then it devolves into what? Politicians deciding whether they win or lose by themselves. And so I think there is a vital role for an objective source like the media to, to play in kind of figuring out who wins and who loses. And, you know, thinking about transitions of power and kind of who's winning. They really don't figure out who wins and who loses. The voters decide that. You know, but with, I mean, it helps. I mean, what they do do. I mean, yes. I mean, so the media is not actually making a decision, right? We're just counting things up for the voters to kind of see what's happening there. How long uh, should uh, how long should Americans wait for to find out who won an election? What is a reasonable period of time? that Americans sh should wait. Now, we won't wait for three minutes for microwave popcorn to finish. <laughs> um, and as we saw, there was a feeling of such incredible relief. I remember the Saturday when I got back to Washington after that heinous week. Uh, sleep, go, we, uh, my boss and I would take three hour sleep breaks. We'd go across the street to the hotel, get some rack time, come back in, because one of us always had to be there in case a, a call ripened and it was time to go. Um, and part of me wished we could have, you know, why you know, why do we have to keep doing this? Well, we had to keep doing it because we started doing it, right? If you start doing it, you can't stop. You've got to see it through to the end. If we wouldn't have, if NBC, I believe, was the first to call Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania came all at once, right? Yeah. Basically, everybody was able to call Pennsylvania, which called the presidency. Um, the period of time between Tuesday at about 11 p.m. and Saturday with the call of Pennsylvania, that was a tense, fraught period. That was an anxious period. Democrats felt pretty confident that Donald Trump was lying. Donald Trump knew that he was lying, uh, but it was getting really weird. And the longer that time stretched out was creating an opportunity for Trump to try to steal a second term. So imagine if that had gone on until every vote was counted. Um, the uh, elections officials, the secretaries of state, uh, have to send in their electoral votes by like the 5th of December or whatever that they have to, they have to remit. A month, right? Would it have been a month before somebody said, no, we have checked, we know, we have the best nerds, and the nerds agree that this is what the result is, and we're done here. It is good in many ways that it is the news business that does this work. Um, because as you said, it's good that it's decentralized. Imagine if, think about this. Imagine if there was a federal election office, right? That was in charge of counting the vote and collecting all the votes. Do you think that Donald John Trump might have put a little friggin' in the riggin' over there? You think he might have tried to fire the commissioner of the vote counting office? Do you think that things could have gotten pretty weird? Yeah. Uh, I read that they uh, tried to send the army out to seize voting machines. So uh, yeah, it would have gotten pretty weird. The need for competitive advantage is substantially, it's gone. I think the, 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 the market answer for this uh, I think is gone, or mostly. But w there is a public service component here that journalists have to do this to tell people what is happening in a period of incredible uncertainty and incredible anxiety. 
I want to, and we're working with Decision Desk HQ uh, at News Nation this year, and I'm excited to work with Decision Desk HQ, and they have a cool way of doing it, and they have awesome data, and it's exciting to be with, to get to work with a whole new bunch of nerds. Um, but we owe our countrymen and countrywomen out of filial love, out of obligation to them to say, this is what happened, this is what's going to happen, and you can go to bed, right? Go to sleep, it's okay. You don't need to sit up looking at the television for the next five nights wondering whether or not the incumbent president is going to seize power uh, and take another term. And I think, we, I think we owe it. Josh, what would you say to people in the audience who would who'd say, whoever appointed the news media, the, or, the organizations who will make that judgment, why should they be the ones to do this? Well, I mean, again, like as Chris, like the media is actually, I mean, it's not, it's just what the media is reporting. Like they're projecting who wins, right? It doesn't actually happen until the votes are actually certified in January. And then like on January 6th, right? And for the presidency, like the House of Representatives, you know, it's being changed now, but like, you know, the actual form, you know, so there's actual legal procedures in terms of how the votes are counted, certified, and when the actual transition to power to, takes place. And so I think the media gives a valuable rule for showing some transparency, like, and tells a story about it. And elections are super complicated. It varies across different states, across different counties, and helping voters see under the hood and, you know, in all of its beauty slash ugliness, right? To get a sense of, like, this is how democracy works. This is where it's going forward. And kind of, I think it helps give a little bit more expectation about what that looks like as opposed to, like, some politician saying, and all of a sudden, we pronounce ourselves the winner. Right, and so having an objective or trying you know, the media, right, and this gets back to Chris's point, like, can the media both be an umpire, but then also trying to, at the same point, try to like show political and keep audience, that's a little conflated there, but like, I think there is a role there for an objective observer to help give the public some objective information what's going on. That's, that's verifiable, like, I mean, if the media makes it wrong, like they did in Florida, right, in 2000, like, they get called out on that, and they lose credibility, right, and so you can lose by making a bad call, right? And then there's, there are repercussions for that, right? So you're only as good as your last call in some sense. Chris, you worked uh, for Roger Ailes, who was the head of Fox News um, before um, a lot of things happened and, <laughs> and then he passed away. Uh, but did you feel the pressure? Did you ever feel the pressure to call a race from management where they said, you need to call Arizona for Trump? No, well, not I mean, Roger wasn't around for that. So, so uh, it is really too bad that Roger Ailes was such a bad man. Um, it is really too bad because, you know, it's funny, when I was at Fox, when I started at Fox, I looked at Roger as the reason that Fox was so incendiary, so by these shows, these primetime shows, it's Roger, it's Roger, it's Roger. And um, I thought, that when Roger was gone, that Fox would become, it would cool off. There would be a cooling. Boy, was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. What happened? So Roger had the capacity, again, unfortunate that he was a sex criminal. Uh, no, I kid. Or I don't, know what the, I don't know what the charges would have been, but it was a, a shameful, the shameful conduct that Roger Ailes uh, and all of the women, and again, a great thing about being in Washington was that wasn't the world we lived in. I worked for Bill Salmon. Uh, th that was not the world we lived in. Uh, so we were pretty surprised to find out how heinous it was in New York. But what Roger was able to do, Roger knew how to play the inside out game. So Roger knew that you could do all the bombast you wanted at night, right? Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity could, or, uh, could do, or what Megyn Kelly could have the most, you know, the, the hot button topic of the night and do all of that stuff. But you had to keep it clean on the news side because we were, I'm a, a proud fig leaf. I was proud to be a fig leaf, right? Because we got to do the stories we wanted to do. We got to be objective and we were left alone. Um, the rise of Trump and the overlay of the Venn diagram of Fox core viewers with Trump created a series of problems for the network. And by then, we didn't know it, but you know, Roger had been undone by his 
vice, right? He had already, he, he, was, he was crumbling from within and he was a sitting duck for Trump. And I will never forget when Donald Trump came after my friend Megyn Kelly uh, after she asked him a debate question that was totally legitimate and totally correct. She said, what are you gonna say when Hillary Clinton talks about the things that you've said about women? And then she listed just a smattering, a light handful of some of the worst things that Donald Trump had said about women. And Donald Trump came after Megyn Kelly like it was insane, right? She's got blood coming out of her, whatever. She's, and it was, and I watched a new Fox and the new Fox caved in, right? The old Fox would have said, you will never be on our debate stage ever again. You will never be on one of our shows ever again. You will never, period, ever be on this air ever again. You're not gonna say that about one of our anchors. You're not gonna do it. But you know what they did? They begged him to come back on. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in Des Moines, Iowa. We were getting ready for a debate that Trump was not going to participate in. And I'm sitting in this conference room in the High V Center, uh, or whatever that is, the, the convention center, and there was a tractor show going on at the same time, which felt, made me feel better. But I'm sitting by myself in this conference room, and I look up on the monitor, and here's Bill O'Reilly, and he's got Donald Trump on, who says he's boycotting our debate. And Bill O'Reilly is begging him to participate in our debate. And I thought, what in the hell has happened to Fox News? And what had happened to Fox News was that these, the Venn diagram overlapped so perfectly and Trump's Twitter was so powerful that he was basically programming the network from his cell phone, right? He was able to dictate which show, I mean, Lou Dobbs stayed on TV for how long? Like, and that's when, that was the moment in 2016 that I said, things are about to get really weird where I work. I, I wanna go back to 2000. I know you weren't at NBC in 2000. But as a result of allegations that Jack Welch encouraged Tom Brokaw to pull, uh, to, to make a change on a call and put, and call the, the race for Bush, you, you talk about getting it wrong, you know? What if we get it wrong? What sort of pressure was there at NBC after that that you saw to get it right? And, and was there ever any pressure to change a call that was, that you had, scientifically put together. I mean, it's, I mean, there's pressure to get it right because like if you get it wrong, you lose your job, right? But there's not pressure that they're like, they're control, you know, so like there is a concrete wall. And so like we're, our decision desk is no longer in New York City when we do, you know, so we're physically separated, right? And, you know, prior to five o'clock, for example, like the networks and the consortium would have a quarantine room where basically I was part of this I mean, I guess this was pre-pandemic language, but like where you'd check in at noon, at noon, they would take your computer, they'd disable the wireless, they'd take your cell phone. There was only three people from each network that were allowed there. There were like these big security guards, you know, that would like, if you had to go to the bathroom, you know, have and help you, they would escort you to the bathroom and stand outside your stall waiting for you because they thought the data that you had was so valuable that they were kind of like worried about the breach of confidentiality. And so like there was like hardcore security you know, in the latter years, you know, I don't know whether it's because of 2000, but when I showed up in 2010, that was the, the protocol. Like the, and so on election night, you had to have a special badge. There was a, a rope line that they stole from the Saturday Night Live set, you know, at NBC, with, again, guards that were there that you had to flash your bag in order to get in. Like, they were not allowed any network people, any on-air talent was ever allowed into the actual room where we were actually deciding and they didn't put us on TV like if you ever saw me on TV that would be going to be a really bad night because you should never see someone like me on TV if I'm doing my job right so like we would tell them when they could call a race they'd always be asking like please tell us when we're going to call this I'm like well it's not there yet we'll, we'll let you know when it meets our standards but until then like we need to get this right because like you don't want us to be it wrong because like you know you think you want it but you don't really want it right because then it looks bad on you and so again like the pressure is really to get it right. Now, obviously, they want to be it quick and they want to kind of be able to kind of tell a story, but like, you know, and it may vary at different places, but like where I work, like everyone at the decision desk, like no one is actually a, a formal employee of NBC News. Like we're all contractors. Like I love my job at Vanderbilt, right? And so like, what could they do? They could fire me, but then I could go back to my wonderful job here, 
right? And so then, like, I probably sleep better because I'm not kind of having this PTSD of election insanity that, that's going yeah. on there, right? And so it's like, so I, there is that. You miss it, though. I, you you know, there, it is. There is something real time about it. But, like, but there is this, there's, there's much more insulation now, I think, in response to that. And kind of because, as you know, like, as the public knows, like, there is this concern that, well, are you putting your finger on the button here? And I think compounding this, getting back to something that Chris talked about earlier, like, people look at all the polling errors. Right, and they say, well, you, post, you know, pollsters can't get the election right. They kind of over, they, they underpredicted Republican performance in the polls. Aren't they just putting their finger on the, on, the, on, the, on the scales when it comes to election night projections? And then, you know, but it's important to realize that those are completely different processes, right? So like polling has its own issues, right? It's very complicated, but on election night, like when Chris is doing his work and when I'm doing my work, like nowadays it's just looking at the actual vote that's coming in, right? It's not as much this kind of art that you have to do in terms of how you're gonna adjust the polling data. So it's a completely different process. I think unfortunately gets a little bit conflated. People say, well, pollsters messed up the polling, therefore the network shop's gonna mess up the calls. But it's, it's kind of very different data streams and very different processes that are, that are being done there. So the trust in journalism and news outlets is at an all time low. It's been going down since the 80s, but it's at its lowest point ever. All institutions are, are experiencing that. But Chris, you know, your book, you talk about, you know, um, why the media rage machine divides America and how to fight back. How do you fix this lack of trust in news organizations? Well, uh, it's sort of like eating an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. Uh, the, you and I owe special obligations to the Constitution because of the extraordinary freedoms that we have and you had as a journalist, right? Um, we owe something to the million men and women who died uh, to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. So that means that if I have a really hot take that I know, that I know is wrong and divisive and wicked, but it's technically true and I can get away with it, my duty, my obligation forbids it. I am, I, I am forbidden uh, by the sacrifice of the, uh, those soldiers and I am forbidden uh, by the great gifts that I have enjoyed as a journalist because of our constitution and our founding. So I can't. Um, it's really corny to say, but this is an inside job. This is an inside out fix. This is not an outside in fix. We have been running around for the past five or six years talking about disinformation and misinformation and who will fix this and how, who will fix this? We will fix this or we won't. Either the men and women who work in journalism will say, I'm not doing that, because I know that's how you get to January 6th, right? I'm not saying, I'm not writing that piece of clickbait crap because I know that that's how you get to January 6th. That's how you get there. You get there a little bit at a time because you tell flattering lies to your audience, you demonize the opposition because it sells and it works. You know, conservatives tend to believe that the market produces, uh, whatever the market produces is good. This is not true. This is not true. Um, new Coke. Uh, this is a thing that happened. Uh, the Microsoft Zune. Uh, this is a thing that happened. Now, ultimately, I do believe that there is a market-based solution here, and this is the second important part. You and I owe, we all owe, what the journalistic work that we do, uh, we have a special obligation. But we all have special obligations to each other. Uh, in his farewell address, Ronald Reagan said, you cannot love America without loving Americans. And we owe each other a filial love, brotherly and sisterly to one another. Now, the McRib is coming out soon. <laughs> and I will eat one. I will, I assure you, I will eat it with my sons on the hood of my car in a McDonald's parking lot on a crisp November day. And I will have no shame in it. 
and I hope people drive by and see me do it, and I hope someone recognizes me, and I hope they say, I think that's that guy from TV eating McRib, and I will say, put it on your Instagram, lady, because I've got no shame. Now, it doesn't hurt you at all, except for the visual, it doesn't hurt you at all how many McRibs I eat. Whatever, shoot the lights out. But if I have a bad informational diet, that's an unloving act to you, right? If I have a bad informational diet, it is an unloving act to my fellow Americans and therefore a dispatriotic act. It is possible in America today to wake up and go to bed and never hear anything that assaults your worldview. You can wake up, if you're a liberal, you can wake up in the morning, you can turn on public radio, you can read the Washington Post, you can go through the whole day and say, damn, we are so good and smart, and those people are so bad and dumb. And if you're a Republican, you could wake up in the morning, you could turn Fox News on, you could go to the whatever the website, whatever the, you know, the Daily Caller or whatever, you could go through those websites. You could make it through your whole day and only be affirmed. But if you do that, it is a fundamentally unloving act because you are teaching yourself to hate other Americans. You are teaching yourself to hold other Americans in contempt. We cannot keep having elections. How we call races, and I think we're gonna do really well, but uh, how we call races uh, is interesting and important, but how we think of the 47, think about this for just a second. In a landslide victory, a landslide presidential victory, 46% of the country voted for the other person. A republic is like a family. It exists because we say it does, because we believe it does. If we are at the point where the defeated will not accept the results and that the victors believe that the other people are just gonna go away, that they're just gonna vanish, we'll finally be in charge and the bad people will be made to go away. So how do you fix it? Our fellow journalists take seriously their duties to the Constitution and to the Republic. There is no American journalism without Americanism. And number two, Americans have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. They have to be exhausted. And God, if you people are not exhausted yet, I don't know what it's going to take. But people have to get tired of it, and they have to get so tired of it that they say, basically, I'm going to set down the McRib, I'm going to try an apple and see how that tastes, see if I, my taste buds will still function in that way. It's a, a really incredible speech, and uh, and so true. Josh, ideas about how we fix it. I mean, I think you know, Chris hits the you know. I mean, it's not like we haven't been seen a very polarized and partisan media environment in the past, right? You think about the 1920s, right? You have all these digital papers. I remember I went to school at Rochester. We had the Democrat and Chronicle, right? And so that's because it was a Democratic paper, right? And so we've been here in our history before. And so sometimes people are like, you know, we're done, and the end of days are here. Like, you know, there, there's no future for, for the country. And like, that's, you know, that's overly pessimistic. Like, you know, the, the country, the republic, I mean, it's always an ongoing process. There's complexity, there's difficulty there. And like, we've been in tough spots before collectively, and then we've kind of eventually kind of, you know, our tastes change and we've kind of gotten out of it. It's not easy, right? All the whole kind of, Spanish-American War, like claimed that that was fake, you know, created by fake news at the time, right? And so, like, so we've been in bad spots before when it comes to public trust and media and institutions and our politics, but it's just it's just something you have to kind of work with, and it's not, it's not going to go away without work, right? It's going to take people making conscious choices, like thinking, you know, it's just easy to always root for your own side, right, without seeing the other people as maybe there's something valid to what they think as well, right? And trying to understand where, you know, how is it that we both have the, you know, the certainty of our convictions, right? There's, but the reality is also a lot of what's going on is being driven by, by the extremes, right? Like if you think about the country, like most people, right, share a lot of similarity. Like there's not a whole lot of differences in the middle about what people are thinking about. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of the discourse seems to be driven by those with the largest bullhorns, right? Those who have the most things they want to get on the couch and scream about, who are most passionate about the issues. Like, somebody just going around that are worried about, am I, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? How am I going to get all my kids to their soccer practice, their hockey practice, or whatever? Like, they're not thinking about politics 24-7. But unfortunately, like, a lot of the times, our media is like 
devolved to trying to create these audience who are the 24-7 media consumers who are far more extreme, right? And we kind of then leave out the critical, like the normal people, right? The average people are just, uh, who have a lot more similar you know, variables. And so like trying to think like how we reach those people, right? And cultivate those people and kind of you know, realize that not to give up hope and kind of you know, be optimistic that you know, there is a possibility there. It's not gonna be necessarily easy, but you know, we've done it in the past. Chris, you've been a public person for a long time. Can you talk, you testified in Congress about a lot of this mm -hmm. before, is it the January 6th committee, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell me the toll that it oh. took on you <laughs> when People, began, when the president and the White House took you on, and the public began to say horrible things about you. Well, I mean, uh, you can ask my ex-wife. A lot of people have said a lot of horrible things about me. This is not. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not uh, entirely unfamiliar with that phenomenon. Um, you know, we chose this. You and I chose a totally weird career, right? Uh, I was not uh, sitting in Wheeling, West Virginia, hoping to become a, uh, a high school guidance counselor, right? I was not like, maybe I'll be, well, anything without math. Maybe I'll be anything without math in it. Uh, and uh, no, I said, I like this. The first time, I got my first newspaper job when I was 17, and the feeling of writing something down, it was an American Legion baseball game, of uh, writing something down and that they printed it like 30,000 times and took it to everybody's house and they read it. And the words that I chose, somebody read, right? Did I say it was a dinger or a homer? How did I describe it? That adjective and that choice, that word choice, that was mine and I got to do that. And I love it and I love my job. I have the best job in the entire world. Um, sometimes people get upset because, my gosh, do people have a lot of feelings these days. I had no idea how many feelings people were having, but they were having all of the feelings. And Donald Trump has more feelings than anyone. He is, he is like a, a scalding cauldron of just raw emotion constantly. And he has a lot of feelings, and his supporters, and everybody has a lot of feelings. And that's great for them. But what I know is that I am very privileged to get to work, to do the work that I do. Um, the scary times for me were in 2016, when it was like, oh, that's a picture of my house that you've just sent me. I see, you know where I live, oh, okay. Or, oh, that is where my children go to school. Oh, I do see. Um, so there's like death threats, and then you're like, well, actually, that's kind of a death, that's kind of a death, that's a deathy death threat for sure. Uh, and now I have to tell uh, security, I have to say, we have to, we need a list and that kind of stuff. Uh, 2016 scared me because, and I was as guilty as anybody of treating politics like sports, right? Here we got this team and we got that team and they're gonna come out here and they're gonna butt heads and do whatever because I was operating under the principle that it doesn't, it matters which team wins if you're on one of the teams, but whether, as I put it in 2020, which septuagenarian white guy from the mid-Atlantic gets elected president is probably not going to determine the fate of the republic, right? This isn't like, it's, it's a big deal, but it's not that big a deal. Like, relax, people. We have this great republic. We have this great system, and the American people are still basically level-headed. So we have these elections, and you can enjoy them. What I found out is that the treatment of elections as sport and enjoyment is only okay if everybody understands it that way. And people had ceased to understand it that way. And they had come to believe and were coming to believe that the other side was illegitimate, that the other side should not ever hold power, and that if the other side did ever take power, that it would mean the end. In 2016, Hillary Clinton's closing message was, if Donald Trump is elected, Armageddon. She literally, her, her closing argument was, and I thought, well, you're setting the bar pretty low for this guy, right? Uh, if all he does is not end all life on earth, he will, have, he will have surmounted the bar. And Donald Trump employed a guy who wrote a piece called the Flight 93 election. And this person, 
wrote a piece that said, yeah, Hillary Clinton is like the terrorists who have hijacked Flight 93. We have to crash into the cockpit and take her from behind the, the, the gears because if we don't, we, she'll crash into the Capitol and we have, to, we have to take our chance with Donald Trump. And I'm like, are you people, what drugs are you people on? What is going on out there? And in 2016, it was revealed to me the depth of these antipathies and how news coverage had been a big part of stoking these fears and telling people if the other side wins, it's over for you. And if you, uh, people uh, don't have to wonder uh, if I don't vote, I live in DC. Uh, but if I did, uh, I don't know how I would vote these days, but I can tell you that Calvin Coolidge is my favorite president of the 20th century. <laughs> so take from that what you will. <clears throat> And Calvin Coolidge, his, one of his greatest speeches was believe in Massachusetts. And it is what won him the vice presidential nod in 1920. Uh, and the point of the speech is don't put your faith in politicians. Put your faith, as he said, in the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Put it in our system. Put it in these things. And if we don't do that, right, if we keep making... Uh, lords and princes and avatars in the culture war out of these goofballs who want to run for office uh, will be done in no matter what. Josh, it, we're almost out of time, but I've got to ask you about the midterms. Is NBC's coverage going to be different in the midterms than it was two years ago? Um, I hope it's not as long. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> you and me both. I'm with you. Any predictions about what, what we're going to see and what's coming? I mean, traditionally, right, midterm elections are a referendum on the president, right? And President Biden polling the low 40s is not a good, is not a good sign for him. Now, you have some uh, interesting Republican candidates that are running in some critical races, right? And so that's what we'll, we'll kind of see. And so uh, there was some talk about enthusiasm for Democrats in the early of the summer. It seems like that's receding a little bit. Um, so you know, whether or not, you know, I think turnout's probably gonna be high like it was in 2018. So I think we've entered, you know, on Chris's point, like it used to be a presidential election turnout was not really great, like 60% or so, and then midterms would, would plummet down to the 40s percent. But now I think like politics is, you know, people are pretty intense about this. And so it's gonna potentially be a high turnout election. It's all gonna come down to how motivated Democrats and Republicans are about the issues that are on, on the ballot. Do you think the NBC's gonna be even more careful about making calls than they were in more careful. I mean, I think we'll be as careful as we've, we've always, always been. I mean, I mean, the, the reality is that elections are much more complicated than they've ever been, right? I, not that I was alive, well, I was alive then, but like back in the 1980s or right, when everyone voted the same way and everyone counted the vote the same way, like that was a simple process. Now we have states that are counting early vote, early in-person vote, election day vote. Each county is counting, deciding, are you gonna count your election day vote first or your early vote first? And like there are all these complexities that are gonna go on that's gonna determine like how quickly the vote gets counted and what type of votes are, are, are being counted. And so there's like more complexity that, that's there. Perhaps not as much as in, in 2020 because there wasn't a, there's not a pandemic in the same way that there was in 2020. Like I'm 2020, like they wouldn't even let me fly to NBC. I had to get in my car and drive Mad Max style across the country. Cool. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, they said kinda do cool. not stop, but like, but, but it was, so we're in a different place. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of see how, how that plays out. I just want to say that um, these two guys do work that makes our democracy better. And um, it's because of them that our public is informed. And it's, an import it's important work, and it continues to be important work as we, as we continue to be divided in this country. And um, so I, I want to thank you for what you do and thank you for what you've been through uh, in the last few years. I know that has not been easy. Um, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate you being here. Um, it's a great discussion. And remember, the book's called Broken News. Buy a second copy in case you wear the first one out. It's good. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you.